Hey, everybody. Welcome to Mutiny. I am not your GM tonight. I'm still Jason, but I'm not your GM because we are not playing a game. We are talking gods and goddesses. We are talking the deities of Galarian on tonight's episode of Mutiny. And I have a couple special guests, two that you'll that you'll recognize. Sarah and Rachel are with me. How's it going? Hello, hello, yeah. hello. Hey. <laughs> and we have two very special guests joining us tonight. Two of our more lore savvy NPC voices. We have the voices of Besmara, the sea banshee herself. Corey, say hi. Hello. How are hello, you? Hello. I'm doing well. Awesome. Welcome. Welcome. Th- thank you so much for joining us. And the voice of the chelish admiral himself, Lupus Gallo. Mike, how's it going? It's going well. How's everybody? Doing good, man. Doing good. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. My pleasure. So, yeah, we we had a conversation last time that we did a mutiny talking about characters and how we build our characters and how we really flesh them out, make them three-dimensional, much more so than just, you know, a stat block that you roll dice and add numbers to. One of the things that we got into a little bit, didn't deep dive super into it, was deities. Because this is a fantasy setting, and like any good fantasy setting, gods and goddesses are a huge part of them. They are living, breathing parts of the world. They actively engage with the world. They empower the clerics and the priests and the champions of the world. So uh, much more so than um, other than any kind of other role playing game in a fantasy role playing game. They they are a huge part part of it, and we could have talked ninety minutes on that, and but we didn't. We decided to break it off into its own separate conversation. So that's what we're here to talk about tonight. Who's excited? Always. Always excited to talk gods. Yeah, yeah. this will be cool. It's something that I'm not very knowledgeable about, so it'll be cool to even just be a listener here and, and learn more about the lore of Pathfinder. As someone who's fairly new to it in general, this will be just really cool. So I'm excited. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and I know that you've mentioned before that you're that you and and Cynthia, you've had your own fifth edition game going on for a while. And I'm sure gods played a big role because, again, it's a fantasy setting. So gods do play a, a larger role in that. But compared to Pathfinder, what's been your perspective? Yeah, so it's funny that you say that because, to be completely honest, gods haven't been a huge part of it. Um, mind you, the, the game that we have been playing was a homebrew based on a story that Cynthia and I have written. So kind of has its own lore behind that but when it comes to this like the 5e setting it's something that i myself and and really some of the players that we do play with haven't really we just don't dive into that kind of stuff that not into that side of the lore so again like i said very interested in knowing this because D &D, i feel like it's not a necessary part of it but in pathfinder it's a little more necessary to kind of know more about your deity and what it could mean for your character and the world itself. So again, that's why I'm fairly new at this and very, very curious to see what, what you all have to say when it comes to this. Just, I'm uh, yeah, I'm curious. <laughs> Absolutely. What about you, Rachel? What are some of your initial thoughts? Yeah, that's interesting. Sarah said about D and D. I was just looking through my dad's old, white box set which was you know before my time but i look through it and gods are not even mentioned i mean clearly clerics are getting their powers from a divine source but they're not you know it's not an established pantheon like it is in galarian lore and even first dead DD was you choose a pantheon maybe it's greek maybe it's you know Egyptian, but you just kind of choose what works for your world, implement it, and then go from there. So it's very interesting that all of Pan- all, uh, Pathfinder seems to have such a well-developed lore that's played across the entire scope. 
Right. And so it's a good, it's an interesting topic that you bring up as part, as part of, you know, having established gods and goddesses because, um, and I'm going, I'm going to toss this one to Mike or Corey, whatever one, which either one of you want to take this ball and run with it. It's my understanding that the, the, the pantheon of gods, especially the 20 primary gods of the inner sea was from a homebrew that James Jacobs was running prior to the establishment of Pathfinder. Is that correct? Not all of them, but a good chunk of them. Like a lot of things in Galarian, a lot of it comes from the, straight from the brain of James Jacobs, but then a lot of it comes from all the other founders of the Pathfinder setting as well, because it was a very much a collaborative effort as they got the game out the door. Mm -hmm. Jacobs just had the largest wealth of, I already have this well-established campaign setting that I've been building. Let's just turn it into Galarian. Mm -hmm. Um, Which is just, is great, but also has its own pitfalls of now it's no longer his to control, and that causes him some strife here and there. <laughs> right. So that's somewhat akin to, say, Greyhawk or Blackmore for the D&D side of things, right? You know, Arneson or Gygax's worlds that became the foundation for a lot of other modules. They weren't called APs yet, but... That's before interesting. The, before the fifth edition players, the uh, the critical role setting at Alexandria has very familiar names. They have Gorum, a uh, uh, Torag. They have uh, Saren Ray. There there are gods from Pathfinder that the that company, you know, Matt Mercer, changed in in various ways. I mean, Saren Ray is still a sun goddess, but Torag is a chained god, a chain god. He's evil in that setting. So it's kind of interesting to see how, you know, there's borrowing from everybody, but I think it was maybe like 70% was from James Jacobs. I think I saw that number somewhere from his campaign. And then like, you know, like Corey said, everybody brought little bits of, of meat to the soup and we have Galarian now. So let's, uh, let's do a quick breakdown. Um, we could talk probably about an hour to an hour and a half on each one of these gods. But real quick, I mentioned that there's 20 primary gods in the inner sea. And this is where the bulk of the adventures, the pre-written stories, the novels, everything about it it happens in Galarian. And um, these are the 20 primaries. Now, there's dozens and if not hundreds more gods and goddesses and lesser beings and demigods out there. But these 20 are the are the ones that are you're going to be most familiar with. When you flip through Lost Omens, Gods and Magic, each one of these has a two-page spread. And so we can quick go down here, and um, we're going to rapid fire this. I'm just going to toss out a name. Um, Mike and Corey and um, Rachel and Sarah, if you, if you know as well, just hit me up. Okay, so um, Abadar. This is Corey's favorite, by the way. Corey's favorite god is Abadar. Barf! Barf! <laughs> uh, Abadar is the god of commerce, of cities, of capitalism, of laws and contracts, and I absolutely despise the man. Yeah, the master of the first vault. Sounds kind of boring, vault. honestly. Yeah, I'm not big into it either. <laughs> it's and, it's um, Christmas duck as the yeah. deity. <laughs> it's uh, that lawful neutral as well. We'll throw that yeah. out there. Lawful neutral. Neutral. You, you could also be lawful evil. Yeah. You can be, but he himself is lawful neutral. That's true. Yeah. All right. Speaking of lawful evil, next Asmodeus, the prince of darkness. He is basically when you when you think of Satan, think of the of the Judeo Christian devil. That is Asmodeus. He is the 
lawful evil god of tyranny and contracts. And that is his the his thing. Red skin, horns, tail. Just, yeah. Smells of lives in fire hell. and brim literally lives in hell. Smells it's, of fire and brimstone. Yep. Sounds Fantastic very singing metal. voice. Fantastic like singing voice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 Horns up on this one. All right. <laughs> if, uh, if if he was an animated character, he'd be voiced by James Woods. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Calistria, the elven goddess of lust, trickery, and revenge. She Chaotic is... neutral. Chaotic yes. neutral. Favorite yep. weapon is the whip. Although daggers are also important to her. Because mm-hmm. you can't be a god of revenge without stabbing people in the back. And a, apparently, she's a Pittsburgh fan because her favorite her favorite colors are black and yellow. We just yeah. Wasps are her there. holy animal because what screams vengeance like a wasp? <laughs> Nothing. I mean, you guys had me at whips. We're, we're good. We're good. Whips, <laughs> knives, <laughs> sexy elf chick. We're good to go. Her temples are brothels, Sarah. They are. That's they are. awesome. I need to look more into this into this uh, deity here. I might Jason. play a champion of, of Calistria next time I roll up a character. That sounds, that sounds interesting. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Her her holy servants are called sacred prostitutes. Like legitimately. I think Juan Jick would enjoy this as well. You <laughs> find some of those temples <laughs> around. <laughs> um next up I know that this is this is one of my favorite goddesses and I know also one of Cory's. Uh Desna. Shouldn't next up be Caden? Yeah. Caden Kalian. You skip Caden. Oh, I did the skip The only Kaden. one I know skip anything the about. Drunk god. What are you doing? <laughs> I'm, I Yeah, sorry. Okay, fine. Caden, um we'll skip over you for now. We're going to do Desna then we'll come back to you. <laughs> he he was ascended. He playing care. favorites. <laughs> Uh, but yes, I, I do very much love Desna. She is one of my favorite gods in Galarian. Um, she is the goddess of travelers, luck, and the night sky. Both stars and moon are parts of her worship. Um, I play a cleric of Desna in a Strength of Thousands game and just absolutely love her. She is... Chaotic good, um, all about freedom and self-expression, and just, she has butterfly wings and sometimes takes the form of a butterfly. Yeah. Ah, just love her dearly. And I believe Syl is a Desnan worshiper. Syl is a very loose follower of Desna. That is correct. (laughs) Excuse me as I write that down. All right, we'll, 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 we'll go right back to the lucky drunk himself, Caden Kalian. Um, this, what well, fun fact about Caden Kalian, he w- used to be human, took on a dare during one night at a bar when he was drunk, blackout drunk, doesn't remember anything of how this happened, and there is an artifact in Absalom. Absalom is basically fantasy New York. It is the center of the world. Um, there's an artifact in, in Absalom called the Star Stone. Now, prophecy says that anybody can make it through the trial of the Star Stone and touch the Star Stone can ascend into godhood. Caden Kalian is one of the three that did it. He doesn't remember how the hell he did it. He just knows that he is now a god. He was drunk. He, he, he was human before he, he became a god, went blackout drunk, woke up a god. Yep. He, Interesting uh, fact. He was out drinking okay. with friends at a tavern in Absalom. They said, I bet you can't do that. And he said, hold my beer and watch this. And oh, no, he took the beer with three him. days later. <laughs> yep. He took the beer with him for sure, Corey. <laughs> yeah, probably. True. Yeah, he is the he is the god of freedom, beer, and party. Basically, <laughs> he uh, uh, travelers also, too. Um, yeah, travelers, no. yeah. 
Him and Desna have a lot of overlap. Yep. And apparently he did it to uh, one of one of the the lines of the Callistra. Interesting fun fact about uh, her worship. They say that Caden Kalian took the start the test to get her attention because she is, um, you know, an attractive elf lady. Which you know, everybody in Pathfinder followers her. say that. Yes, her followers say that. Correct. His followers will argue you into the ground, and if you <laughs> ask him himself. He I don't will remember. get righteously angry at the assertion that that's why he did it. Very true. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love this. All right, you will um, never taste a good beer in your life again if you ask or if you say that to him. You can never get drunk again. <laughs> yeah. yeah, every single beer tastes like bush light from here on out. <laughs> And doesn't get you drunk. No. Yeah, non-alcoholic bush light. God, gag me with a spoon. Ugh. <laughs> All right. Um, Erastal. Who wants to take this one? He is um, He's a piece of work. Barf this guy. again? <clears throat> yeah, he's a piece of work. Uh, he is the lawful good. God of... Farming in small communities and family. But he has very, uh... Backwards? Let's say traditional ideas of what constitutes family. Mm -hmm. What constitutes a marriage and family? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, he's, um... Yeah, he's a he's he's a piece of work. This guy, uh, but yeah, he's he's the he's the god of hunters and farmers, small communities. So we'll just we'll just uh, move right along, and we're going to go to Gorum. <laughs> Gorum, th- th- this is uh, this I believe, if I remember correctly, that Sarah, your first edition Pathfinder character, Lulu, worshipped Gorum. This is the god of war, the god of uh, weapons and war and the war. <laughs> Destruction, might yes. and zeal. Save me, save me. Our Chaotic Lord neutral. Our Chaotic Lord neutral. in iron is yeah. his, uh, his epitaph. Basically, fight, fight, fight. That's his whole thing, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. To yeah. die in battle. He... Yeah, it's better to die in battle than flee, is one of his aphorisms. Yeah, what isn't there a like a really badass um, belief that orcs have that like if you can die, it's okay because this gives you a chance to fight Gorum and to take over his godhood. Something something along those lines. Sounds a little Viking esque. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Pretty much. Very, very much yeah. so. Pretty much. Next up we have Gazra. The wind and the waves. Um, true neutral, I believe. True neutral, yeah. Um God They're... slash goddess. Yeah, dual dual of yeah. the air and the sea. Um his male aspect is the god of storms and raging tempests. And his her female aspect is the goddess of calm seas and water bodies. Yeah, super cool. Super cool deity. Doesn't somebody follow Gazra, right? That's that's doesn't somebody follow Gosra? Gosra was a was a big player in our Extinction Curse uh, game. Okay, I was like, I do know this name. Okay, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and um, really? I'm not going to spoil that for anybody who uh, yeah. who is playing or who's planning to play Extinction Curse. But yeah, Gosra plays a pretty big role in at least book one of Extinction Curse. Yeah. 
Next up is I I know also one of Corey's favorite goddesses. <laughs> We're gonna fight. Oh, okay. <laughs> We're gonna fight about this one. <laughs> it, this one is Iomade. I have played a lot of worshippers of Iomade, um, because she is the paladin goddess. Um, she is one of the other ascended humans. Um, one of the other starstone ascended humans. There are a couple of ascended humans that ascended before the starstone became a thing. Um, but she is one of the three to touch the starstone and become a god that way. Uh, in life, she was the herald of Eridan, the now dead god of humans. Um, and she took up his followers after he passed on and became basically, she's not just a god of humanity like he was, but she took in a lot of his displaced followers along with the ones that followed her for her own pursuits of law and justice and battle. Um, and like, I like to play paladins, so I have mm -hmm. played several characters that worship Iomede. Um, I played a character who became the herald of Iomede at 20th level and 10 mythic tiers. Um, so like, I have a soft spot in my heart. She can be a little bit of a, uh, a frost queen. Um, yeah. She's very stern, very serious. Uh, and really, what you think about when a lot of people think about paladins, she can be a stick in the mud. Lawful good, then? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I've always, I've always pictured Iomade as Captain America, female, minus the America. Like, truth and justice. You know, and see, I mean, the the Herald of Iomede that I played was Captain America, but female minus America plus Mendev. <laughs> yeah. Like fought with a shield and everything. Yep. I, I have also played a lot of paladins in my time. And uh, I this is where Corey and I will have a disagreement and probably have to have an entire conversation maybe on on record or off record of my theory is I believe because of her, of, of Iomade's name, the inheritor that she killed Aridin. And this goes back and uh, Rachel, you can attest to this because you played uh, original D and D too, that you can kill a God, but you take their pet, you take their portfolio when you do it. Anybody yeah. can kill any God. Absolutely. You keep what you kill. She didn't specifically take his portfolio, though, and she was already a god when he died. Well, maybe that's what happens when a god kills another god. She just inherited god. his followers. That's what the sure. inheritor part is. Sure, sure. When you inherit somebody's anything, it doesn't mean you killed them. It means that they left it to you. Sure, in, in one way of inheritance. But I also think like a necromonger, which is probably one of my downsides, that you keep what you kill. Uh, we could talk about Aridin in it for, for three hours, and both of us would be like, <laughs> yes, but still, it's Aridin. Just an interesting theory yeah, I have. He deserved I mean, it. I would be, it's fine. I, 100% he deserved it. We will, <laughs> think, we'll, 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 we'll save the Aridin conversation for another, because I, th I think we will have to split up this um, this whole, We could, yeah, we could talk at length about more about lore and gods. And I think we'll have to, there, there, there's probably a lot of road there to tread. And that's something we'll consider as a, as a 25 North spinoff. Um, <clears throat> next up we have Irari. This is this, this one has a, he has a soft spot in my heart because when I don't play clerics and 95% of the time I do play clerics, or divine caster of some sort. But in the 5% of the time I don't, I play monks. And Irori, 
is the lawful neutral god of self-perfection. And he is basically Buddha in Galarian. That's that's kind that's kind of how I how I viewed him. Mm-hmm. Do you have anything to add? Uh, a couple of things. Uh, he he was also human, but he did not ascend via the Star Stone. Uh, he ascended by unlocking mental and physical perfection for himself and just becoming a god. Yeah. Um, therefore, he looks down on Iomede, Kate and Kaelian, and their brother, who we will talk about in a minute. I don't want to even say his name until we do. Um, <laughs> because he feels like they cheated to get their divinity. Because they took the same path that Aridin took. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of uh, a lot of monks, a lot of uh, characters who are striving for that self perfection. A um, lot of psychics. Th- psychics as well. Yes. Iroris. Iroris your is, is your deity of choice. Here's where we start getting into more of the evil line. So far, none of the gods that we've mentioned have been evil aligned except for Asmodeus. Now we start getting into a lot more of the evil gods. <laughs> and other than Asmodeus, we're going to go right into probably one of the more... Um, when you see art of this goddess, it's it, it, it takes you aback a little bit. This is Lamashtu. She is the mother of monsters. <laughs> she... <laughs> Think think of jackal head. Does she have a jackal head almost. Yep. Three eyed jackal head. Three eyed jackal head and a like third trimester pregnant belly. Covered in scars. Covered in scars. It's it's and uh, always it's shown. A, like yeah. her clothes are a loincloth and a skull bikini. And she's chaotic evil, right? Or yes. neutral evil. Chaotic evil. Cha- she is an ascended evil. demon lord. Yes. Um, she's the and... goddess of monsters. Like, that's all you need to know. Like, Yeah, goddess of monsters. Commonly known as the mother of monsters. Yeah. Hence the pregnancy aspect. She also has, like... Black wi- black feathered wings and a like crocodile tail because she's just multiple monsters fused into one creature that mm-hmm. is eternally pregnant with other monstrous spawn. Uh, she is a chief deity among evil goblins. Yeah, and um, yeah, okay. Monsters and nightmares. Nightmares was the other part. Yeah, that's right. So uh, Desna hates it, her because she killed the previous god of beasts that was Desna's mentor. Yeah, she's a she's 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 a sight. <laughs> that's the nicest way to put it, Jason. She's a sight. <laughs> well, this that I, I was going into a segue because speaking of sight. There is a specific website out there called The Archives of Nethys and our next god. <laughs> I made Corey sigh on camera. Oh, okay, this this is good. Um <laughs> The next uh the next god is Nethys. So Archives of Nethys is a website that contains all the rules for Pathfinder. If you want to go out there. You don't have to buy any of the books. I urge you to buy the books because they're amazing. But you don't have to. You can see all the all the rules out there for free on Archives of Archives of Nethys, A-O-N. And it is named after this god. This is the true neutral god of magic and knowledge. Known as the All-Seeing Eye. He is the other ascended human god that ascended before the Starstone was a thing. Um, and 
he ascended by unlocking all the secrets of magic and just becoming a god that way. Um, ascending also broke his brain in half. <laughs> Literally. Mm. And he's a dual um, god. He is a dual god. One half of him wants to destroy the world, and the other half wants to protect the world, and they are eternally at war. Yeah. The analog would be Mystria, and for for D and D, that that the Great Hawk Pantheon, you know, basically magic, magic, magic. Yeah. Um, he's one of the few gods that doesn't prefer his. Uh, his clergy to be clerics. He equally loves clerics and wizards and any other form of spellcaster. As long as you know how to spellcast, you can be in his clergy. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's curious. I wonder what he thinks of psychics. That would hmm. be interesting. Yeah. All right. If if you if anybody if any of the listeners out there know, um, comment in our in our Discord. And the last of the three Starstone Ascended Gods is Norgerber. I like Norgerber. I think Norgerber is really cool, and the reason I do is because he has four. Yeah, I think he has four. Um, how do I want to put this? Aspects. Four aspects, yes. And one of the aspects is a, tr- even though he is a neutral evil god, one of his aspects is true neutral. So as a cleric player, it's always fascinating because you can be a true neutral cleric of Norgerber as long as the aspect of Norgerber that you worship is the true neutral one. It's pretty cool. Um. Norgerber is the god of secrets and assassination and what's the other one? Like murder or poison? Murder and thievery. Yeah. Trickery wealth. He's 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 your he's your stereotypical god of thieves. Uh and like people know somewhat how his siblings Ascended. Like, people know that Caden got drunk and went into the Starstone on a bet and came out the other side of God. People know that Ayamede, as her 11th act, threw down her cloak and walked across the the ravine that separates Starstone Isle from the rest of Absalom um, as though it were a bridge. And came out the Star Stone the other day. Nobody knows how Norgi. I I affectionately refer to Norgerber as either Norgi or Norgerberger. Um, because I know he would hate both of those, and it delights me to know that he would hate those. Um, nobody knows how he did it. I think Norgerberger should be in Cynthia's um, Cynthia's homebrew. <laughs> um, like nobody knows how he did it he was just a god one day and they know it's because he touched the star stone and that's it god of secrets and he will protect that secret until he dies he snuck in with the other two, with one of the other two and just hid and then waited for them to leave <laughs> and was like give me good segue because the next god is the goddess of death speaking of Speaking of dies, potentially, potentially the most powerful deity in Galarian lore. Mm. This is uh, this is Phrasma. She's known as the Lady of Graves. Probably my favorite out of all the deities. She is the true neutral goddess of death, birth, and prophecy and time. She is the goddess that once you your character dies, once any anybody dies in the world she is the one that judges where your soul goes afterwards um she she lit she sits on a throne 
in her plane called the Boneyard. And um, I'm not going to get too deep into the lore because um, we could go for hours. We could go for hours. And one of the most um, she plays a huge, at least part of her lore plays a huge role in potentially the most the most famous second edition adventure um, abomination bolts. So I thought you were talking about Tyrant's Grasp. But I was about to be like, yes, you're right. Indeed, is, that is also <laughs> correct. Well, yes, in Tyrant's Grasp as well, but like in second edition, yes, it's Abomination Vaults, and she, her lore, or part of it at least, is pretty pivotal to that story. So, um, the only thing I really want to say about her is she is the last surviving deity of the last universe, and was therefore the first deity of this universe. And who knows? Maybe she'll be the last deity of this universe as well. She's so cool. All right. Rovagug. Hit me hit uh, me with Rovagug, Mike. Ah. Uh, the, the rough Mike. beast. The rough beast. Uh, chaotic evil. Destruction incarnate. Um. Uh, uh, I think before we started recording, I referred to them to to it as a uh, monstrous Kirby. Uh, it just eats and eats and eats. Uh, I think seven gods were needed to imprison it inside the bowels of Galarian. Galarian is the prison of Rovagug yep. itself, yep. and there are uh, pillars and spears piercing it, ho- holding it down. Uh, I believe Osirian, they are uh, constantly bombarded with spawn of Rovagug. And, uh, I mean, you know, basically think Xenomorph Queen meets Tarask. Meets uh, Divinity Tarask to it. is one of Rovagug's yes, spawn. Indeed. Yes, that is yeah. correct. <laughs> I'm trying to think of the, um, oh God, which, which one of the Lovecraft monsters is basically that he just eats and eats and eats and eats and eats worlds. Um, starts with an A. Uh, oh, God, I know it. Cynthia probably would know, but she is not here at the moment. I, I am as digging through my... As, as a thought. Yeah, as a thought. Yeah, as a thought. Mm-hmm. yeah I, that, I'll, I've always gotten, like, as a thought when I thought thought of Rovagug. Like, just yeah, God of um, destruction and just eats and devours and destroys. And that's all... They exist to do. He is bad enough news that several of the good gods teamed up with Asmodeus Mm -hmm. to put him down. Yep. The enemy of an enemy is a friend situation. Asmodeus holds the key to Rovagug's prison. Yes. Didn't Grandmother Spider steal that key at one point? I think so. Yeah, I think she has it now. <laughs> and Grandmother Spider is one of the lesser gods, and we could get we can. I love Grandmother Spider too. She is one She's of my one favorites. Of the lesser gods of the main inner sea region. She's one of the primary <laughs> gods of the Mwangi expanse. Right. All right. Um. All right. So real quick, we have like. Five more to go through. Saren Ray. Sun. The sun. The Everlight. Um, if you are familiar with Critical Role, Pike started yes. as a go- a, cler- uh, a cleric of Saren Ray. Um, before they switched to 5th edition, Pike was a cleric of Saren Ray. And that's why you'll still see those aspects when you see Pike. Yeah, neutral good goddess. She's awesome. Patron goddess of the Broken Tusks. Um, and just goddess of redemption and fire in the sun. And we have Shaylin, another neutral good goddess. Goddess of art, beauty, love, and music. She is... She's also... One of my top three. I love uh, Shayla. And she's in a polycule with Desna and Saren Ray. Yes. She, she, it's, yeah, Shaylin is awesome. And 
her her favorite weapon is a glaive, and what's not to be what's not to love about that? It's there's a reason bad. for that, and we'll get to that in just a minute. That's what I was gonna say too, Corey. <laughs> One of my favorite bits of lore is coming up soon. <laughs> It's, so fucking it's cool. the very last one, and I'm, I want to talk yes. about it. But uh, yep. no, she she's great. Um, she is the goddess of all things pretty and yeah. finding beauty wherever you may see it, and just she's fantastic. Wan Jik would be a good worshiper of her, actually. Well, Wan Jik worships Bismara. Well, yeah, don't try to we take away my one. follower. <laughs> but, uh, I, I listen, I love Bismarck as much as the next the next guy, but it's also it could be, you know, in a different alternate well, universe. We could we'll get into that in just a little bit too. Um you don't have to be monotheistic in in, in this game. So um Torak, god of the dwarven god the father of creation, lawful good. He's the god of protection and strategy and creation. Um, if you're the, a lot of alchemists worship him because um, they create, they create their weapons, they create their bombs. Dwarves worship him because in their lore, um, he was the one who created the world. Dwarf um, daddy. He is the dwarf daddy. He has his big ass magnificent beard. It's all aw- he's awesome. <laughs> his sacred colors are gold and gray. What's more dwarf than that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Warhammer is his is his favorite weapon. We all knew, Jason, that you were going to take that one. Oh yeah. Dude. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Your inner then, dwarf um, is showing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And probably um the last one on the list that's uh, out of the 20 that's like my top five, I guess. I started as three, but now it's six, is Ergothoa. I love Ergothoa because Ergothoa is the pallid princess. She's the goddess, neutral evil goddess of disease, gluttony, and undeath. And I fell in love with Ergothoa when I saw her art. It's yeah. so metal and yeah. badass. Uh, she it is, is so... a beautiful woman from the top to the top, from the top. And then once you hit the waist, she is just rotting flesh and skeleton. With a giant scythe. It's it's so fucking metal. It's so cool. I, this um, is the one you showed us mm-hmm. not too long ago, right, Jason? The one that kind of sparked me to go buy that book. Yeah. <laughs> She's creepy. I, I love that. Uh, it's, it's unsettling. It's awesome. <laughs> seems like another Norse... Uh... Borrowing from Norse mythology, right? Like hell is yeah, top uh, beautiful female bottom skeleton. Uh, yeah, she's she's the um, goddess. Like I said, the goddess of gluttony. Um, if if you're if you're a worshiper, um, like she encourages you to seek out what you want and just take it and not let go. It's um, Her yeah. Holy it's, text is a cookbook. How to serve but it humans. Is a, yeah, it's a cookbook for cooking sentient life and eating it. <laughs> she, so she's, also, <laughs> she's also the only being in creation that knows where uh, Tarba Fon's phylac- uh, sorry, soul cage is. Yes. Soul she's cage. the only being in creation. She hid it herself, and I have theories about where that is, but that's just because I get to make up where it is now. Yeah. All right, all right. We're not we're, we're not going to belabor the point any longer. We're going to get to uh, Zan Kuthan because, the, uh, like like Corey had alluded to, the the lore oh. for Zan Kuthan and Shaylin is so good. Um, we're 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 actually running out of time, but um, <laughs> but we're we're gonna, we're going to hit this point here, and um, because I want because I want folks to hear this because it is so awesome, and I'm going to mute my mic and just let Corey go. All right. So, if I have a favorite evil god, it's Zani K, as I affectionately refer to him. Um, again, like Norgerber, I know he would hate this, so I do it. Um, but Zonkuthan uh, has been one of my favorite deities in the setting since I first read Curse of the Crimson Throne 15 years ago. Um, 
he is the lawful evil god of pain and torture and darkness. Um, he looks like Pinhead from Hellraiser amped up to 11. Um, he is the brother of Shalin. Um, he got lost in the dark reaches of eternity. The, the black nothingness between the stars, and he came out changed. Um, when Asmodeus was or when Rovagug was chained to the world and Asmodeus helped all the gods put him down, he was known as Dao Brawl. Um, I don't remember what Dao Brawl's alignment was, but it was good. Uh, because he was paired with his sister. And he... He is the one that drove the spikes into the world that keep Rovagug there. They are known as the uh, the Star Towers. All throughout Galarian, they are chaining Rovagug in the in the center of the world. Um, but when he came back, um, his sister was very distressed at what happened to him. They fought. She took his favored weapon, a glaive, and made it her own, which is the, the little bit of lore we were mm -hmm. referencing earlier. His new favorite weapon is a spike chain, because what is more metal than that? Um, he is just so flavorful. He has an entire nation that worships him. Um, the nation of Nidal worships Shadow and Pain and him. He... Mm. Uh, yeah. and one of my favorite NPCs in any Paizo adventure path is, I won't name her, uh, oh, and come I, on. All, all right, I'll name her, uh, no. uh Leori Veas. Uh, she is a, an elven cleric of Zani K that, like, most clerics of Zani K are dreadfully serious and just love inflicting pain and love getting pain inflicted on them. She is a Zani K worshiper who is a cheerleader. Mm -hmm. She is peppy and excitable and loves inflicting pain, but does it with a smile on her face and a pep in her step. Uh, when I introduced her in my Curse of the Crimson Throne game, I had her I introduced her by having her skipping rope with her spike chain because it fits her personality. Yeah, she... Yeah, Zonkuthan was much the same. The first time I read about Zonkuthan was when I picked up book two? Is it book one? or I can't remember. It's just, I think it's book two of Curse of the Crimson Throne when, they, when Leori shows up. Uh, she shows oh, yeah. up in book three. Is it three? Okay, wow. But yeah, there you have it. Though that's the quick, quick, well, quick and dirty. <laughs> that was a 40, 45 <laughs> minutes, forty-five minute conversation on the twenty gods. Like I said, I think we're gonna break this down, and uh, we might be able to do a whole episode on each one of these. <laughs> but what I wanted to do is, I wanted to establish those twenty, because these are the twenty main ones that you'll find in Galarian for the adventures that you run. If you run Pathfinder second edition, these are the 20 primary ones that you should know as, as a game master. And you're probably going to want to know if you're a player, especially if you're going to be a cleric or a paladin, because they are the two divinely powered classes. Um, the, one of the things that Pathfinder does is they if you wanted to worship a god if in order to properly worship a god they give you a range of alignments that your character has to be one of these ranges of alignments in order to for that god to consider bestowing their power upon you so if you wanted to be a cleric of 
Norgerber, like I mentioned, even though Norgerber is a neutral evil god, one of the followers alignments can be true neutral. So if you, you could be a true neutral cleric of Norgerber, um, and he will still bestow his, choose to bestow his power upon you. So that's one of the, do we have any questions on that? How, how very, how does that differ from fifth edition, Sarah? Um, does it differ at all? Do they kind of do away with alignments or does anybody else know off the top of their head? Um, if I remember correctly, and it has been a bit since I've touched 5e, but I know that they, there's alignments on your character sheet. You try to follow them as best as you can. I mean, we were a little wishy-washy when it came to our games. We didn't, we weren't sticklers for it. We just kind of let it go. But yeah, I do know that you, you do pick an alignment. It's still part of it. Mm -hmm. And for, for the old hat, uh, AD and D. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, you needed an alignment. It needed to align with your god. Um, Low-level clerics did not get their power directly from their god. They got it from, you know, lesser gods who worked for a major god. Um, But same general gist that you had to, you know, do what your god said. You have to follow your alignment or the god will revoke all of your, you know, clerical powers. You'll be screwed, so... Right. Which now we have, what's it called? Anathemums. Anathema. Yeah. Anathema. Yeah. That's the, Anathema. that's exactly what I, what I was trying to um, get us to next is one of the cool things that they added was that when you look up your God, um, when you choose one, whether you're a paladin or a cleric, or I don't think there's really any other class other than paladin and cleric that needs to follow their deities, edict or anathema, at least not right now. I think at some point the Inquisitor will come out and they'll probably have to follow their their cleric's de- uh, edict and anathema. But what that essentially is, is edict is this is a, the God wants you to do these things. And they kind of give you like a list. This is like three or four things of like, hey, this is what you should strive to do. And anathema is the exact opposite. Do not do these things. Um, for example, as a Ferasman, a Ferasman follower in um, Abomination Vaults, one of the things is toy with the undead. Like, do not raise dead. Do not create undead. Because, as you can mention, the goddess of death and birth, she doesn't like when people skirt death and, and move on. So um, that is one of the anathema, like as a follower for asthma. Mike, Corey, anything you wanted to add? Uh, I, I was, I was actually. If you didn't have one up real fast, I was going to have Ergothoas for no reason at all. I had Ergothoas <laughs> on, on my mind. Uh, I mean, her, also fun fact: Ergothoas is also a uh, ascended being. She was originally a, a mortal woman, and then went to the boneyard, did some things, and bounced out and became a. Uh, a, a divine undead creature, but her edicts are like become undead upon death, cr- uh, create and protect the undead and sate your appetites. Her anathema anathema, however you want to say it, uh, deny your appetites, destroy undead and sacrifice your life. Like, you know, continuation of the party is all her basic, you know, and yeah. undead and party. Yeah. Uh, go after what you want. Satiate your appetite. Now, um, that being uh, said, we kind of talked about divinely powered classes. Oh, sorry, Corey, was you going to say something? Uh, one of Desna's anathemas is to cause nightmares because she's the goddess of dreams, which I don't think we actually mentioned when talking about her because uh, I only mentioned yeah. travelers and luck and the night sky, but she's also the goddess of dreams. So causing nightmares we, we... is... Yeah, we alluded to it when um, we said that Lamashtu is the mother of monsters and also the goddess of nightmares. So, now that being said, like we mentioned, uh, these are divinely powered classes where they get their powers directly from their gods. That doesn't stop anybody from worshiping a god. Like, if you are a non divinely powered class, 
feel free to use the gods. I sure, I sure do. For me, when I create a character, gods are really big, a big influence on my character and how I build my character. Um, they are a major ingredient in creating that character. So even though I'm a fighter and I have no divine abilities whatsoever, I go ahead and I'm going to choose to worship Cade and Kalian. And that immediately tells me that, hey, I love booze and I'm all <laughs> about freedom and partying. And so that informs my character. I could take that same fighter and I could choose to have them worship Irori. And it's a completely different character. Everything about them is the same. The stats, the weapons they use, the feats I choose. Everything is about them is the same, but I just changed that one aspect, that one ingredient from Cade and Kaelian to Irori, and you have a completely different character. Yeah. Um, it is a very rare occasion that I do not have a deity in mind when I create a character. Um, mm -hmm. They are, like, no matter what, whether I'm playing a divine class or not, my character is going to have somebody that they worship because it's important to me to inform that character, like Jason said. Um, my poppet barbarian, and poppets, for those new to the game from 5th edition, uh, poppets are soulbound toys. Uh, in this instance, I am playing a stuffed eagle barbarian uh, and Buttons, the Poppet Barbarian's uh, deity is Gorum the god of battle I love that I love that so much I do think it's important though on a similar note that the level of devotion for the characters mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. important because not at every character, even though the gods are actual tangible things in this world, not every person in the world is going to be a devout follower. So, you know, for Syl, for instance, you know, sure, they worship Desna, they've got their cards with Desna on it, but it's not like they're going to the temple every day offering, you know, money up. So, or like Jason, you said last episode where your character's can worship multiple gods. You can, yep. you know, just yeah. like in any polytheistic society, different situations are going to call for different gods. You're absolutely right. I mean, like Mike, Mike's uh, made a co comment here in the chat that listeners can't see, but Pathfinder two has second edition has over 200 deities. And we're talking like minor deities, uh, demigods, like, the heralds and angels and lords and like every one of them can be is can be considered a deity that somebody can worship. There's a whole lot of them out there, and to 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 have a character who just worships one and shuns all the others is just kind of silly, like you said. So uh, I've always envisioned, um. I've always envisioned the, my characters to worship multiple gods. For example, in um, the Wrath of the Righteous game that I was playing with Cory that I dropped out of, um, my dwarf worshipped Torag and Asmodeus. You know, he, he's a dwarf, so he grew up worshipping Torag. So Torag is still very, very important to him. But as he, as he became much more powerful in the Wizard Academy... Um, he kind of shifted his um, worship to Asmodeus to get that that devotion, that um, that drive um, that was required to complete the Wizard Academy. And just like you said, you know, you could worship multiple deities. There, you could also worship none. That's also an option in a world yeah. where gods demonstrably exist, which is an interesting. There's an character. entire nation that is built around being a 
basically an atheist theocracy of no, we don't allow worship of gods in our country. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure, they exist, but I choose not to worship any of them. That that you can very well do that, absolutely. Or you could worship a, you know, a, a pretender god. You could do that as well. There is such a thing as the pretender god out there. Yes. <laughs> Here, here's a question, you know, if, you know, talking about homebrews and things like that, does Pathfinder, you know, if we really wanted to go into the weeds of it, does it allow you to create your own god? I suppose it would, right? Absolutely. A- absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It won't the... be canon to the setting, but you can absolutely use the the framework that they give you to build a god of your own, to give it, it to give a god domains, to give the god edicts and anathemas favored weapons like you can use that framework really easily to build your own pantheons and your own deities um and slot them in however you would like right because you can homebrew pathfinder just as much as you can D D or any other system absolutely yeah the Which is um cool. the 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 really cool thing that i'm doing for 25 north is um, a lot of the main gods, like especially these 20 gods, they have heralds. And heralds are, just think of them as like um, vice gods, if you will. If you we're talking presidency, you got the vice president. Heralds are like the vice gods. And Davy Jones is a herald that I created for the podcast. I, that, Damn he is you, not, Davy! <laughs> he is not canon to, to Calarian. Though it kind of like boggles the mind of like, why wouldn't he be? It seems like a missed opportunity, but I'm well, guessing plus one is two on that one, right? Right. But um, I'm guessing there's probably like legal rules or something, some kind of right stuff. But yeah, you can um, feel free, go nuts if you for you if you want to use the gods in your game, use any of these twenty. Use none of these twenty. You can create your own. Um, these twenty are just some of the main ones in. The world that my podcast, that the 25 North podcast takes place in, and that any of the pre-written adventures that you'll find that's written by Paizo takes place in. Um, and yeah, for, I, th- I, I want to talk so much more about them, but we're already reaching time. And I think we're going to we're going to do a whole separate show and go through each one of these, because I think there's a lot of appetite out there. Speaking of sating appetite and Ergothoan, as a good Ergothoan myself, we're going to sate that appetite and we're going to go ahead and see if I can't get Corey and Mike and maybe some others back on to go through this list one by one and give you some more deep dives into the lores of these gods. Any other questions? Before we go, we have to do our dice draw, right? Yeah, we will. We'll get to okay. that. Just making sure it's not like you're wrapping up. Um, I yeah. do want, I do want to mention one more thing, because Jason, you mentioned gods and magic, which is a a two e uh, campaign setting book. Um, and it's fantastic. It's a great primer on the gods of Galarian. But I'm also going to recommend for anybody who wants to learn more about the gods, the first edition campaign setting book, Inner Sea Gods. And now a lot of the rules in that book won't apply anymore because they're all first edition rules. But the lore in that book is immense. Um... Jason mentioned that each of the gods in Inner Sea Gods gets a two-page spread that tells you about the god and basic rules for them. Each of the gods in Inner Sea Gods got, I think, an eight-page spread. Yeah, it went real deep. Detailing things like how their church operates, what their holy texts are, how the, what their temples look like, um, how adventurers play a role in the worship of that god, their relationships with other gods. Like, it's just such a 
wealth of lore. And while the rules are outdated, the lore is not. And mm-hmm. I highly recommend it. I was I was rereading my copy right before this because I didn't know how deep we'd get into each of the gods uh, so that right. I could go as deep as I could. Yeah, and if, uh, if the book might be hard to find uh, as a hard copy, but you can go to Paizo's website and get the PDF. Yeah. Um, it's And you can just download it and get it real quick. And I've, in my first edition campaign, um, I think I sent it to our cleric of Shaylin, um, Rachel's sister, Jessica. I sent that eight-page spread of, of Shaylin to her. I was like, hey, this is your goddess. Here you go. If you're going to be a cleric, you're going to want to know this stuff. Nice. Yeah. Um, for my Wrath of the Righteous game that Jason mentioned a little earlier that uh, he was briefly in, um, I made holy texts for my players uh, for their deities. And I basically copied word for word from inner sea gods and whatever other resources I could find for each of them just to detail as much information as I could for each of the each of the players' gods so that they could learn as much as they wanted or as much as they didn't want to learn about mm-hmm. their gods. I kept this yeah yeah I kept this I kept this like quiet and hidden for a while because I know my players listen to this podcast. So you know guys five four three two one cover your ears. Uh, I'm writing the next potential AP we're going to play that is literally the Starstone test for the for the group. Sweet. So Very cover your cool. ears, guys. Hopefully you didn't hear that, that they're going to start, you know, it's going to be a big old dungeon dive, and it's just going to be, at the end, they fight, I don't know, maybe, oh, I don't know, one of the most famous baddies in the setting to touch that stone and get their abilities, get their powers, and then, you know, fun happens from that, but that's something I'm looking forward to, and that's what I've been doing for a while yeah. now. Sounds awesome. Rachel, Sarah, yeah, any cool. other questions, comments? I mean, you answered a lot of the ones that I had coming into this, so that's great. Well done. Well done. <laughs> um, but no, I think it's very cool. And the, the fact that the lore is so incredibly deep when it comes to Pathfinder, I think it's just one thing that, I don't know, that it really attracts attracted Cynthia and I to it. And just, yeah, trying to learn more. We got that, the gods and magic book. Because, yeah, again, just reading more into it. I probably should have brought it in here with me. So I could have helped carry the conversation <laughs> a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, and I, uh, I, I had to share travel guide because I had to share the page that has the weather patterns on mm-hmm. it for our meteorologist friend. Yes, I do like that. Yes. <laughs> and when, you're, uh, when you're, you guys have time. Right over there, I have about 12 Pathfinder Tales novels. They just take some of the NPCs and they just tell a story using some of the NPCs. They're great. Very nice. Yeah. Uh, Some of them are fantastic. Do you have the the ones that would tie into this conversation that I'm thinking of are um, the ones by James Sutter, Redemption Engine and... uh, What's the other one? No, I don't have Redemption Engine. Uh, um, there is a series by James Sutter that involves a an atheist inquisitor of Phrasma. He is from Super the cool. atheist country of Rahadum and got forced into being an, inqu- an inquisitor of the goddess of death. And it's Super just cool. a fantastic series. All right. Core or court. Rachel alluded to it, so let's do this. I have a 28. 28. How are we going to roll 28? Let's see here. Um, Roll a d20 and a d8. Well, that'll skew the probability, though, if you had roll two dice. You know what? I'm. Should I just do it on here? I, I have a dice roller that I think I can on my phone. Let's yeah. do a d28. I don't have a dice roller on my phone. You know what? I'm going to do it in Discord. Oh. Discord works too. 
Yeah, here. I was going to ask if Google has just a dice roller. <laughs> it does. <Yeah. laughs> there you go. <laughs> Roll 1d28. There we go. 1d28. And enter. Corey, you can confirm this because you're in the same ser- the server that I just rolled this in. It is a 15. That is a 15. Let's go down the list. We Number have... Number 15. 1, 2, 3, 4, Oops. 5, 6, it. 7, 8, 9, 10... 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Oh, look at that. That is Mr. Cold Brew Crit himself. Harold of Rumplank. Jeff, buddy, I will reach out to you and get you those dice. Congratulations. Congratulations. Ooh, congrats. Congratulations. Confetti. You did it. All right. <laughs> Any parting words? Yo ho ho. <laughs> That's all I got. Of, <laughs> all right. Bottle of gods. <laughs> Bottle of gods. All right. Thanks for thank for joining us, Corey, Mike, Rachel, Sarah. Yeah. Um, we at the Twenty Five North Podcast. Thank you so much. We'll be back with another mutiny next time. I don't know what we're going to talk about. Maybe more gods. Maybe alignment. Who knows? Until then, take care. Bye bye.